Thank you for that for that music painted a beautiful picture of what we have to look forward to yes, Lord. in this world. The world doesn't offer as much, but God offers plenty. Hallelujah. And I just thank you for touching us with that song this morning. God is good. His mercies are forever. Praise and glory be to our God. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me, please. Gracious Father, we've been blessed this morning. And if this was it, I would be, I'd be filled with your spirit, ready to go home and enjoy the day with you, Father. But we ask for your spirit to be with us, to continue with us, and bless us, Father, and bless the word that we may draw ever closer to you in glory and praise and walk with you in this world of sin. When you come, Father, walk with you into the heavenlies where we will reign with you forever. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' glorious name, amen. The last couple of weeks we have been looking at the prophet Isaiah and what he has to say to us. And I've always loved the book of Isaiah. I can't say that I intended to be in Isaiah preaching these sermons. That's God's doing. But I've always loved Isaiah. He has beautiful, beautiful things he talks about, the things of God, the hope that we have in Christ, our Lord and Savior. And last week, the sermon was, Look to him, look to Yehovah, and be saved, all ends, you ends of the earth, everyone. Look to God. He is your salvation. He is your strength. He is the one who will come in, work in our lives through the Holy Spirit, and empower us to live the victorious life that he's called all of us to live and all of us into, to experience his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his love, and all that he has for mankind, for us. Amen. Today, we will look at another scripture in Isaiah. And the sermon this morning is the glory of Yehovah, the glory of the Lord upon you, each and every one of you. We all should come to know and experience the power of God, the glory of God in our lives. Like a light shining out of thick darkness into and shine his glorious light of grace upon a fallen world. We should shine with the glory that is Christ. And we will. And those who follow him and believe in him will shine like that glorious light. We'll look at Isaiah and, and look at some practical insight into what? What? look to the Lord and be saved, might have and might look like to some of us. How do we get there? Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 6. You heard it read a few minutes ago. Arise and shine. Why? For your light has come. The glorious light of our Lord and our God has come. It is here. We're not waiting for it. It's not in the parking lot waiting to, to pull up. It is here if we will accept it and walk in it. God is present with us. And his light shines in us and through us like nothing else can. Rise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of Yehovah is risen upon you. And I pray that the glory of God, the glory of the Lord, the glory of Yehovah has shone upon each one of you. Because if it hasn't, it ought to. 
And if it's not, we ought to get our lives together so that we can experience the gracious and wonderful and beautiful things of our God. Because I have not seen nor ear heard the glory thing God prepared for his people. And it starts here on this earth. We will get pie in the sky someday when we die. Heaven starts here. We are of this world, but in the kingdom of God in this world. And his glorious promises pertain to us as well as to those of old. The glory of Yahovah is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness upon the people. And we live in a world where deep darkness encompasses everything. People shrouded in sin and have no idea what's going on in their life. They can't understand things that are happening. Deep darkness on the people. But Yehovah will arise over you, and his glory will be seen through you, through us, through his people. If we allow him, it's a choice that we make every morning of our lives, every moment of every day. We choose to allow God in. We choose to let his glory shine through us. It's our choice. And he promised that if we allow him, he will shine in us and through us, and the world will see the glory of God in us. We have no glory of our own. We're like the moon. It reflects the light of the sun. We reflect the light of the, our Lord and our Savior, our glorious King and Redeemer. And his glory shall be seen in you all. And the Gentiles, those people hated by the Jewish nation, is either... The Jews or the Gentiles, the Jews or the Romans, the Jews or the Greek, it's always them against everybody else. And I pray today as, as God's church, it's not us against the world. That we look to them as people of God, that God wants in his everlasting eternal kingdom. Because that's the reason we are here this morning. The reason we're in this world, to spread the gospel of his grace. The Gentiles shall come to your light, your lights that shine through you, the light of the glory of God, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. And if you're not rising, who will come? God calls us to rise up, to take a stand for him, and he will keep us standing. This messianic, messianic promise that we just read from the Old Testament was intended by Yahovah to be fulfilled by Israel of old, whom he had selected as his chosen people. A royal priesthood, he called them, and he calls us. They were positioned at the crossroads of the then known world, blessed by God in every way possible, and given every advantage so that they might perform his great work of redemption to all the nations of their day, everyone, including the Gentiles. Bringing the Gentile, those not of the Jewish heritage, into the glorious light of God's salvation. And that's God's plan for all mankind. In every age, it doesn't change. Bring us into the glorious light of God's salvation. That great work which God planned for them, for Israel, is recorded in chapters Isaiah chapter 60 through 62. We won't go through that. But you might spend a few minutes one day or one evening reading through those promises. Beautiful, beautiful promises. Myth yelling promises. And many of the promises will be fulfilled. Christ, when he came, they could have been fulfilled, but they weren't. And they're still yet to be enjoyed, to be appreciated, and we wait for their fulfillment. Amen. Unfortunately, Israel lost their moral bearings, and they failed to keep Yehovah before them. On, and sometimes I think we may fall into the same ditch and forget about our God. When things are good, we tend to 
go on without God and, and uh, one day lead to two and two to three and pretty quick we get somewhere and we don't know how we got there, how we arrived. Things just happened. God called them, Israel, again and again to repent and turn back to Him. Away from sin and back to Him. He called them to a reformation from within. Not without. Within. A reformation that consists of the heart. New creatures. New people. Filled with the glory and the power of God. That was his design for Israel of old. That's his design for us today. He called us to a revival of practical religion. What does that mean? We'll look at that. A revival to practical religion, which God clearly laid out for them. And Isaiah 58, and I might add, he lays out for us as well. In verse 3, look in Isaiah 58. Verse 6 through 8. If you go there, turn with me in, in your, with your Bibles. But in verse 3, uh, a question is put to God regarding their worship, at least one aspect of it. We won't go there. Yes, we will. And verse 3, it says, they ask, asking God, why have we fasted? And then they say, and you have not seen. You don't take note of what I'm doing for you. Fasting, hurting, grieving. And yet you have not seen. We have afflicted our soul. We're all called to afflict our souls. And you, Yehovah, do not take notice. And in verse 6, we see God respond to these questions. Isaiah 58, verse 6. And Yehovah speaks and says this, Is this not the fast that I have chosen? He's asking a question here. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Now he goes on to explain that fast. To loosen the bond of wickedness, of disbelief. The biggest problem in this world, even among Christians, that we may be practical atheists, we hear the word of God, it sounds good, but do we really believe in it? Do we really walk in it? To loose the bonds of wickedness or disbelief. The fast I've chosen, God says, is to undo your heavy burdens. How many have heavy burdens this morning? And many of you do. To let the oppressed the captives go free. That's God's design, His intent, His desire for us, His people. And that you break every yoke, every yoke of bondage. He goes on in verse 7. He said, Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? That hadn't dawned on me. Light hadn't come on. Share your bread with the hungry and to bring into your home, your house, the poor who are cast out. Practical. When you see the naked, that you cover him with clothing, whatever he needs, whatever they need. And not to hide yourself from your own flesh, your kin, who may be in need of something, or not to turn away from them, but provide for them. And then verse 8, he says, Then, the table turns here, If you do all these things, then your light shall break forth like morning. Dark. Night, horrible night, but the morning, the light of morning breaks through and everyone is joyous and breathes a sigh of relief. Then your light shall break through like the morning, 
but a breakthrough after we have shared our bread with the hungry, after we bring home the poor who are cast out, the naked who ask us to cover, not hiding from our own flesh, loosing bonds of disbelief, helping our brother with heavy burdens that they're bearing, to help set the captives, the oppressed free, and breaking down every yoke of bondage. That's what God wants us to do as his people. That is the good work God calls us to, and God called all of us to a good work. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, quickly, where before it didn't. And your righteousness shall go before you. Your righteousness, our righteousness, our good deeds, God will take note of. They'll go before us. God, Jesus, come in the clouds of heaven, and his reward is with him to give every man according to his deeds. It's all connected. And so the glory of of Yehovah shall be our rear guard. He'll be with us to keep us, to guard us, to protect us, to sustain us in everything. These are the things that they give us that are practical, that we are to make part of our lives as we walk in this world of sin. We're not here just to look good or feel good or have a good day, we're here to be a blessing to those around us who are not so blessed and who are struggling in this world of sin. And it's interesting, you go around all the people who are struggling today. It's amazing. Jesus in his discourses, many discourses with the people and the leaders of the Jews in that day picks up on every one of these points. It's amazing. <laughs> He wasn't developing new theology. He was reading from what he had studied in the Old Testament and simply brought it forward. In Luke 4.18, I'll read, The Spirit of Jehovah is upon me. Jesus' words he spoke in Capernaum, in the synagogue, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. In Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus speaking, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Amen. And one thing we need is rest for our weary souls. Amen. This world will wear us down and out. Sin does not quit. It's continuous. We need God. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. That's why God called us. That's why he called the church to do his work, his bidding, to be a blessing to those around us. Right. Turn to Matthew 25, 33. Matthew 25, verse 33. This is Jesus talking in one of his parables about the kingdom of God. Amen. And he says in verse 33 through 36, and he will set sheep on his right and the goats on his left. On, That's us. We the sheep or goats will be divided. There'll be a clear distinction between us and the world if we're of God, walking with him, the distinction and the glory seen in us will be that of God and not that of the world. Darkness will prevail there. 
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. He goes on, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. In prison, and you came to me. And you remember their response. The response to, to this discourse by Jesus. Lord, when did we see you hungry or naked or in prison? When did we see you these this way? And he'll, he responds, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. God made it very clear what he wants for us in this world. Church is a great opportunity to give praise and glory to God. But none of us are in church seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We live in the world. We're part of the world. Not of the world, but part of the world. And God calls us to be a blessing to those in the world. In these scriptures of Isaiah, God clearly laid out his plan for his people and the nation of Israel to prepare them for that glorious work before them of bringing salvation to the Gentiles. God called them, his chosen people, to a great work of revival, reformation, and restoration. And I might add, he called all of us to the same work because we all need that work of restoration, reformation, and revival. All of us do. We live in a world of sin. Our hands and feet get dirty, stained. We get distracted. And don't walk with God. Don't focus on Him like we ought to, like His Word says we should. He called Israel to that great work of revival, reformation, and restoration. We see that in Isaiah 58, verse 6 through 10. But history sadly records the words, they, but you would not. In his discourse with the scribes and Pharisees in the temple, Jesus spoke to the hardness of the hearts of the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes, and not just them, but every generation. And to Israel's unwillingness to remain faithful to their God. They struggled with faithfulness. And I pray our struggle is not where their struggle was. But we struggle as well. It's a constant fight to be with God, to stay with Him, because that's not the norm. We are born in a world that's at enmity, animosity, hatred toward our God. That's where we live in, and that's the way we are born. We're not born attracted to God. We're born with a desire to leave him, to run from him. But when God gets his, his love and his heart in you, those things fade away and they become our natural inclinations. In Matthew 23, verse 37, turn there if you will, Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus speaks to this point and their hardness of their heart throughout they're, they're called a nation to God. Isaiah 23, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he's in the temple, talking to the Sadducee, talking to the Pharisee, talking to whoever would listen, giving them truth. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the ones who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to her, and they had again and again and again. He said, How often I want to gather your children together as a hen. Their children, he's talking to previous generations, not just their children. How often I want to gather your children together. 
throughout the generations as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And I pray that everyone here won't find themselves in this situation, that we will not find ourselves not willing to receive the mercy and the grace and the blessings that God has for us. That we'll honor His leading, honor His voice, hear that voice, and be true and faithful to that voice. How often I want to gather you together, all your children, but you were not willing. They rejected God. He didn't fit their profile. And they walked away from him. They didn't know the time of their visitation. And they were left wanting. When either rejected Jesus the Messiah, God's calling upon them as a nation came to an end. His plan for them to proclaim the plan of salvation to the world ended. Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 21. Turn there, if you would, Matthew 21, verse 42 and 43. There are repercussions to everything we do. God gives us free choice, every one of us, but they do come with consequences. And God admonishes us to, to choose wisely. Choose wisely because our eternal reality hinges on our decisions, our choices. Verse 21, chapter 20, and verse 42 through 43. Jesus said to them, speaking to the leaders of the Jews in the temple, Have you never read in Scripture the stone which the builders rejected? Who are the builders? Those teaching the word of God. Those building up the kingdom of God are supposed to be built the kingdom of God. The stone which the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone of that very building. He goes on, this was the Lord's doing, Yahweh's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. What a glorious God. Praise God. And he says, verse 40, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. The privilege of taking a gospel to the world that you've had for all these thousands of years will be taken from you and given to a nation that will bear fruit. I can't imagine the hurt that Jesus felt when he had to speak those words. I can't believe he just ripped his soul apart to speak those words to his people. But he had no choice. They saw wonderful, marvelous, fantastic healings, raising the dead. They saw all these miracles and they just hardened their hearts. And miracles after miracle will not cause us to walk with God more fully. They don't. They tend to fade after time. We need the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God to live and dwell in us. And the Holy Spirit to keep us alive in the things of God. And those privileges and responsibilities of the covenant that once belonged to Israel, were given to a nation that would bear fruit. They were given to those who before were not a nation. The church was chosen by God to take the everlasting gospel of the kingdom to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That's the church's commission. And that's our commission. And it's interesting that God's church is comprised of folk from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Right. Amazing how God works. It is marvelous in our eyes. 
And that work, speaking of chapter 60 through 62, that's yet to be accomplished, that bright and glorious picture of the triumph of the gospel, spoken of by Isaiah, clearly belongs to God's people today. The church, us, all who believe, all who claim his promise, all who choose to walk with him, they have the blessing of taking the gospel to the world, to all mankind. We are God's agents to bring salvation to the Gentiles and to mankind. And the church will be triumphant. Let be no doubt about it. She will be victorious because God is in our midst, in the midst of his church, his people. He said, I am with you and will be in you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have his promise. The church will be victorious. It will be triumphant. We talk about practicality, practical religion. By faith, God calls all of us to obedience to his commandments. And all of us know what those commandments are. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel 36, 27, God said, I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to walk in all my statutes that you'll be sure to obey all my commands. And through his power, we can. Through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, he will transform us to do just that, to walk in his way so that we won't lie, steal, cheat, kill, bear false witness or lust after things that are not ours. That we will learn to be content in every situation that Paul did. Whether you have much or little, it matters not. We can come to a place in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit where we are content in whatever is going on in our life and at total peace. But I believe God is calling us to much more, to a much deeper transformation than just an outward obedience to these Ten Commandments. We're called to obedience to the Ten Commandments. Make no mistake about that. But God here in Isaiah and the, and the New Testament is calling us to him with something much, much deeper than that. That's basic. That's the reality of what he expects from us. Because we're good doesn't mean we get blessed by rewards. God doesn't work that way. His blessings are showered upon his people on the holy and the right, the righteous and the unrighteous, the just and the unjust. And we bless more than they. But God calls us to live a life of his love. Not your love, not my love, but his love in and through you, each one of us. Why? To demonstrate to the world and to other Christians the character of God lived out daily in the life of his people. You've heard this before, but Paul says it this way, my message and my preaching. And he talked about much more of the lifestyle choice he had made. It was, it was obvious in everything he did, not just his, his message and his preaching. That it, his life would be a demonstration of the spirit of the living God and the power of the living God working in us all for all the world to see evidence that we are truly of God, we are his children, and we're told in the first John that we can know that we have everlasting life. He calls us to a deeper relationship of love with him. Galatians 5.22. That's not on the, one of the scriptures on the screen. 
but God gives us the fruits of the Spirit. Let's turn there real quick. Galatians 5, 22. And they're important and they're very key. Because where do they come from? They come from God. They're not things you are innately born with. No. That's sin you're innately born with. These come from the finger, the hand of God. If you have them, because he gave them to you, the question is, what are we doing with them? 22. If you read before that, you'll see the works of the flesh. Things that are not of God. And here he contrasts the things that are from God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That is underlying reality and character of God. That's essential for us to go anywhere that God calls us to. Love. God is love. He calls us into that love. He poured out his love to us through the Holy Spirit whom he's given to us. Secured us to eternity. And if we have the love of God, then we will show joy in our lives in serving him. Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It goes on, against such there is no law against these things because they're of God. They come from the hand of God given to God's people, those who choose to abide in him. We abide in him. He abides in us. And when we do, we receive blessing just by living the victorious life that God has given to each one of us to live. Love is foundational. The foundational truth of Scripture. If we're going to overcome what lays ahead of us, if we're going to stand in a time of trouble like never was, if we're going to stand in the small time of trouble, we need the love of God in our hearts and lives to do and to deal with all that's coming, to deal with all the people that we will be dealing with. And it won't be pretty. We need the love of God deeply embedded, ingrained in our hearts, in our minds, in our very soul. And we look at the cross. We see that was the exact reality of Jesus. Nailed to a piece of wood, beaten, bloodied, beard pulled out, and how did he respond? Father, forgive them. Forgive them. That's a love you and I don't have to give. But a love each one of us can have and can give by the power of the indwelling spirit of God. That love will take us to a much deeper experience with God than mere obedience to the law. Is obedience important? Yes, it is. But God wants us to take a step up, a huge step, to go above the law and to see the reality of his love behind everything and in everything. Both Isaiah that we've read and Jesus' words in Matthew plunge us into that deeper, richer experience that is possible only by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each one of us. And God is calling us to that today, this morning. Revelation 14 provides us, his church, with a clear and well-defined mission for our day. As with Israel of old, we too are called to do a glorious work for God. And let there be no mistake, it is a glorious work. Because he is in it. We are co-laborers with him. We come and he furnishes everything that we need. Everything. We live in a world that is shrouded with sin. 
where countless thousands walk in darkness, which don't land shadowed by death, and most are unaware of the plight that they are in and what they're facing, what lies ahead. In the days of Jesus, as in the days of Jesus, those now in darkness in this world will also see a great light. The marvelous light of the gospel will shine upon them as it did when Jesus walked the earth in his day. Revelation 18, 1 reads, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. The angels like us, they don't have their own glory. They reflect the glory of God and do it very well. All glory is from God because there's only one who has glory, and that is the divine God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God is calling us this morning. And to those who answer that call, we must prepare ourselves, themselves, to walk in the light we have all been given. We're told in Scripture, not the hearers who are justified, but the doers of the word, if we're sitting, admonishing, and not doing, we have a problem. We're called into a much deeper relationship than the Jews had, a much deeper relationship than you and I had this morning. We're called to repent, as was Israel, to turn away from our sins, turn back to God. Called to our reformation within, as they were, a reformation of the heart, a true reformation of the heart to a revival of practical religion. Not just hear, see, and feel good religion, but practical religion, pure and undefiled, James tells us, to put others first, to give food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, to the stranger, take him in. Clothe those that are naked, visit sick and the imprisoned, share care for widows and orphans, and to live justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. God has called us as a church to a great, a great mission that lies ahead to take the gospel to the world, but not just us. There'll be others. But God needs us ready, prepared to receive his power because he won't dump his power on a bunch of half-baked Christians. God's much too wise for that. And he knows what inept human beings will do with power that's beyond their control. He's seen throughout the ages what men have done to mankind. That's a mistake he won't make. But those who are ready, those who are prepared and have prepared themselves, he will pour out his power, right. his glory. Jesus said, I did not come to serve, but to be served and to give my life a ransom. Did I get it wrong? Jesus said, I did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve. Thank you. I'm going to get that right. Not to be served, but to serve. He came as the servant. And he gave his, ransom, his life a ransom for all of us, everyone. We all need the heart, the mind, and the soul, the essence of Jesus Christ. The heart of a servant who gave it all to God, left nothing, nothing. Gave it all. He emptied himself and allowed God to do in him the glorious things he knew needed to be done. Then shall the glory of Yehovah rise upon you. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness 
shall go before you for all to see because the glory of Yahovah, he shall be with you. He shall be with us, with me. He'll be our rear guard. He is all, everything to us. And he wants us. He needs us. He's calling us to prepare. Yes, obedience is important. And obedience comes not because we choose to be obedient, but because Jesus comes in and makes that possible manifest in our lives every moment of every day. But he's calling us to something much deeper, something much richer, a greater, a richer, a fuller experience with him. He's calling us to rise above where we are today and to become people of light, doing his good and glorious will, seeing his glory work in us and in the church around us. Not this building, not a denomination, but in his people. And I pray as we move forward in this time, because things look to be getting worse and not better, that we're taking these things to heart and looking at what God wants for us. Israel came to the place, the Jewish leadership came to the place where they where the man could say, all these things you have said, the law I have kept since my youth. Paul said that. Something different, but basically the same thing. And yet, Paul had no understanding or of who God was and the power that God could use to bring change and transformation and the mighty deeds he could do with mankind, sinners. And God's calling you and I to the same thing. And our reluctance to move forward may keep us from receiving that power. And I don't want anybody, anybody to be in that situation. We need him. We need his power. And it, it's available to us, to all who believe, all who will accept, and all who will turn to him. So call him. Invite him in. Do some soul searching. Where are you at? Where'd God have you? What does he want for you? He wants the very best. That's right. But unless we're willing, he can't give us the very best. That's right. When either rejected him, he could no longer cover them with his grace and protect them from the onslaught that was coming. He could not. And the same thing is true of us. There's an onslaught coming. Many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands are going to die. And he's our only hope, our only chance. We need to turn to him and look to him, what he wants of us. He's calling us to glory, calling us to live and experience all that he has promised in Scripture, and it is a lot, much of which we have not experienced. Place in the churches where they're growing by the tens of thousands a day. We're not. We're the same prayers and people who have issues. Lonnie was telling me earlier with major issues, bleeding stuff, and they healed instantly. You know, we're not seeing that. But God wants us to live and experience all those things to His glory and to His honor. And I just pray that everyone, everyone here will take it to heart and choose to follow him and ask him what we have need of because our need is great. And as we move these things out of our lives, as we choose to live for him, he will fill us with the power of his Holy Spirit. Right. And we will shine. Right. We will shine as he shined. We'll reflect his glory. Right. He's living in us powerfully and mightily to bring salvation to all mankind. Bow your head with me. Gracious Father, we are living in a world, Father, where 
we struggle on so many levels. And you are the hope that we have, the means by which we can move from where we are, be transformed by your glorious power, your glorious light, Father, and become new creatures, totally, completely new creatures in you. And you want that for us more than anything else in this life. You want our salvation and the salvation of every man, woman, and child on this planet, in this world. So Lord, I come to you this morning inviting you into each heart, each mind. May they dwell on you. May they seek your will. And may you lead them and guide them in their walk with you so they'll come to know, experience, and taste the powerful things of God and know that you, he is good, that your mercy endures forever, and that you, Father, want the very best for us. We thank you and praise you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.